Great. So thank you everyone for coming. We're delighted to have speaking to us today, Marina Cortez from the Institute of Astrophysics and Space Sciences in Lisbon. Marina has worked on lots of different issues in cosmology and general relativity, including time asymmetry with our illustrious colleague, Dr. Gomes, amongst many other things. Um, but today she's going to be talking to us about uh, a new field which she's trying to initiate called biocosmology. So over to you, Marina. Thank you so much. It's um, thank you, James, for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Enrico. Um, number one, I want to say that it's such a treat to be able to give a talk in an audience that knows what ontology is and reductionism. Um, and the physicist, do you know what reductionism is? More or less, yeah, yeah. So this is my life. When I give talks, we, we people... all know what it means, but we agree. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's yeah. a lot of oh, yes, yes, yes. It's, uh, well, a lot of physicists don't, don't know what reductionism is. I mean, quite a lot of it. Cosmologists don't know. Um, and so, and you guys being so mathematically trained at the same time that uh, you know what ontology is. Is, is is a very unique um, privilege as a as a speaker. So I I really pleased to speak at such a um, a high level uh, philosophy um, department. So yes, biocosmology. I am actually like, like uh, James said. I'm a bio. I'm, a, yes, I'm not a biologist. <laughs> I'm a cosmologist um, and a theoretical physics person. Um, which I will also try to avoid uh, describing, uh, but I came to biology as a uh, asking questions about uh, the time, the fundamental nature of time, and if it is it irreversible or not. Uh, it's, I've got a good opportunity here to. Oh, hmm, there's no uh, pointer in the thing. I know it's. A, it's oh, it's fine. It's fine. So uh, these are the people, more or less, that I can attribute um, uh, or that, that I can thank. Um, there is a lot of the, over here for the physicists, this is uh, um, Ellie and Avi are um, quantum mechanics uh, interpretations of retrocausality, the transactional interpretation of Aronov being there. Than that, uh, Barbara Drossel is a physical physicist, incredibly enlightened, for in my uh, opinion. Um, George Ellis, we know in, in, in cosmology. Greg Eink uh, comes from the group that Mark and I put together over the summer that is today uh, discussing about um, chaos and determinism, ontology, quantum mechanics, uh, random or not. Um, Nicola Gisan, uh, who is an exper experimental physicist by nature, by uh, training. Then uh, I'm not able to, I think, name the Google people, uh, but Google research has been really helpful in explaining to me what is possible at the computer level today or not. Stu Kaufman is a biologist of complex systems and also co fellow, uh, founder of this, um, of our science. Jaron Lanier, uh, you might know, he's the founding father of virtual reality. That is uh, quite, uh, uh, quite peculiar. Andrew is over there. Mark Nyre is also over there. Oh, I didn't put Simon's heart. Oh, yes, he did. Yes, because of the Z. <laughs> so so uh, Simon, Simon Svart, I met in, in, uh, at Perimeter Institute uh, 10 years ago, and was the first person ever to alert both Lee Smolin and I to the uh, that there is a, an issue with simulating the computer, the, our perfectly symmetrical uh, phase mechanics, classical mechanics description. So uh, I really attributed to him a lot of uh, our th my thinking ever since uh, 2014 or 2013 when he visited. Uh, so biocosmology is, is physics. Um, I, I want to use biology as a means to, to learn more about physics. And I, I wish, I, I hope, my ambition is that one day we will be able to describe living systems um, with, within theoretical physics and in a non-patronizing way. So from first principles. What I mean by first principles is um, 
specify an ontology <laughs> or uh, specify the elementary particles of, of, uh, of fundamental elementary particles that are at play or degree of freedom that are playing in living systems. Um, typically, we have, uh, of course, biophysics and astrobiology. Um, this, this interaction with, with physics, with biology from the physics side is very superficial and phenomenological. It's almost as if we say, okay, well, we know more than you, uh, but we're going to study some effective regime of physics, which is in, in fact biology. So it's a little bit like a patronizing way. We're not really paying attention to what a, a living system can, can um, teach physics from the very principle of how it operates. Um, and, and in physics, not in this room, but believe me, uh, because I've given this talk at Perimeter Institute, we believe that um, the normal laws of physics operate at the micro level. They are sufficient to determine the evolution of all systems in the universe, including humans, including life. And um, you'd be really su surprised by how many, name, no names, um, number of physicists really believe, theoretical physicists believe that uh, microscopic level equations in physics will determine evolution of, of of, um, in, of all systems, including living ones. And so my hope and what I found as a physicist was that by taking seriously what, what drives the evolution of a living system, we can learn and maybe uh, solve some problems of, of physics. So number one, what is the ontology of physics, and I, uh, of physics, of biology? And I can already tell you that if anything, if you take home anything from these lectures, it's the, the statement by a theoretical physicist that we have no idea what are the elementary degrees of freedom governing biology. Uh, the, certainly not the, the standard model of particle physics. That's not what we believe. Um, these questions uh, that we ask First in physics about, uh, I guess I can, I'm gonna say reductionism, of course, when you go uh, from theoretical physics onto biology, the first question you ask is about what is the validity, what are the boundaries of reductionism? And it's the reductionist assumption that everybody believes to be valid to such a degree that it's only a practical impossibility to, to determine the evolution of the universe by using reductionism techniques. What are the limits? Um, recently, I hosted this, moderated this debate um, with some very interesting uh, people. <laughs> um, John Joe McFadden, I'm told, is around here. He is? University of Surrey. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So it was, was incredibly interesting. Uh, Sarah and Alex Rosenberg was, were, uh, so Sarah's an astrobiologist, worked, collaborated with Paul Davis, and Alex uh, is a philosopher of biology. Oh, you, you, know, you know him? Oh, yes, no. oh okay, yes. So the, it was re really, really nice debate. However, I'm told it was not recorded, and if, my, I might have to pay for it myself, even if I worked for free. In in um, in moderating it, so it's it's the questions that us physicists are asking that begin in quantum at the quantum description have echoes or everywhere in physics, and so I am founding a new level, a new science in biology because I've started asking about the arrow of time, and and these are the questions. I'm not. I don't have time to go through in individually how the, the question of reductionism uh, respects here in quantum gravity and on the ontology, uh, the randomness in quantum mechanics, what is the, the problem with the quantum measurement, why this quantum computing is not built yet, the black hole information paradox in unitarity, real world fluid mechanics, um, which we don't have here a person of, but, um, <coughs> Uh, Charda is, of course, an expert in large-scale astrophysical simulations, 
and large scale cosmological simulations. Mark is visiting us this week here in Oxford, and we hope to be able to uh, derive some results on the validity of reductionism uh, for large scale evolution of galaxies. I mean, or what, what, how do you call them? The, the filaments? Of... Cosmic web. Uh... Cosmic web, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what is the next thing? If, if we look into a system, which is alive, as physicists, so we don't know what we don't know what governs it. What is the first thing that we can do? If if we the first thing that we need to do as physicists is say, I don't understand what's going on in there. Or you the, my assumption here is that we've left the the computing uh integrating all the equations of motion for each individual particle in the universe that is left outside. And if you want to question that. I will have a conversation with that based on uh, discussions at Google and with, with Microsoft. Um, so, but I'm going to assume that we believe that uh, one cannot integrate, I don't know how many, 10 to the 10 to the 10 equations of motion for each particle in the universe and determine what's the next step. And so let's look at living systems. What is the first thing we can do? Well, we don't know. We can count. Let's see what we we want. We're searching for a common language between physics and biology. Let's count. Um, and so th this is the way that it is uh, portrayed, I guess, in the media, that uh, we have been able or proposed a quantification between whatever, I mean, here we can talk about microstates, physical microstates of, of the universe which correspond to the value of entropy today and the physical microstates that we have naively been able to attribute uh, to a, a generated by a living system. Um, and so this is the quantitatively part, which is important for me because, uh, I mean, if you start looking at a system that is not, does not behave according to any laws that you know, uh, first thing that I want to do is go back to basics. What can I count, uh, if, even just to begin with? And so, how did it begin? Um, Stu visited us, um, uh, Lee and I, and Enrique. You were also kind of organizing, right? <clears throat> Our time in cosmology meeting in 2016. And uh, Lee uh, Smolin had uh, discussed to me what is the, the theory of the adjacent possible, which uh, is a very similar concept, is the most, the closest similar way of thinking about biology that I know for theoretical physics. So it describes uh, biology as what I understand is like a tangential flat space time on a, on a manifold. So at each point, this, the biological system is as a growing uh, a tangential adjacent possible to decide what is the next step in, in its evolution. Uh, and the, the set of possibilities in a living system is so large that you cannot pre-state from one moment to the other what is going to be possible next. Uh, this is called the adjacent possible. It's not a priori possible. And he gave this example of uh, you're in a pond somewhere and a bacteria happens, swims accidentally onto a, a, the swimming bladder of a fish. And uh, this, the fish finds the swimming bladder, the, the bacteria finds the swimming bladder quite a hospitable environment and uh, obtains some advantage, selective advantage, and the fish also obtains selective advantage. Now, these two uh, objects, the bacterium, and the, the swimming bladder are evolving as what we call a bound state in physics. Uh, there's different ty types of bound states um, that I, I will go into it, but so, some of them are effective uh, and some of them are fundamental. And it, what uh, my argument is going to be that uh, the bound states in, in biology are so novel that they're, they're fundamental. And so the emergence is strong, is a strong kind. And uh, in biology, we can talk about a Hilbert space or 
or of a, of a configuration space or is classically or um, quantum mechanically. But the, the point is that it's the claim at, at this point of the theory is that you cannot state or list what is the kind of in, in infinities. Uh, and so Lee and I went to Stu. Well, firstly, he argued with me for, for a long time before I thought that this was going to be possible. Uh, but, but then we went to Stu and said, well, in physics, we can regulate infinities. I mean, if, if it's infinite, then we want to regulate. And um, this here is an equation that I will explain in a little bit. Um, so what is the first thing you want you can do to a living system if you're trying to get it understand it from as a physicist? Uh, the states, you call it uh, po the possibilities, you're going to identify them with microstates in physics, in classical physics, say. Uh, and we have an indication from biology that the number of possibilities of the next step, the number of microstates, is so large that we cannot count it. And so how I thought, well, I mean, the number of microstates in the universe is abound. There's a Baconstein bound, the uh, Hawking, Baconstein Hawking bound of black holes. It's not, you cannot have uh, microstates growing and growing in the universe just in our planet, in our biosphere, because the physics we have about, which is given by Stephen Hawking and Bacon Um So um, I started, well, let's let's see what we can do with these. Um, and of course, I mean, what, what, what do we count in physics? You want a Lagrangian. It's the first, the first thing, you want a Lagrangian formulation. Um, and if I, if I have a Lagrangian, then I can compare the biology state with the largest number we have in physics. And that is um, 10 to the 124, which is um, the, in natural units, the entropy of the cosmic horizon due to uh, the universe being dominated by dark energy. Uh, Ted Jacobson spoke here recently, and uh, Ted actually uh, told, me a few years ago that this 124 being together very close to the 120 of uh, uh, Roger uh, Roger's number Roger Penrose that was a they don't really understand why dark energy seems to have the same entropy as um, a system which is only gravitational <clears throat> bound if you guys I mean Roger Penrose lives here right so you know that he has a he has a number. Uh, which is, I think, 10 to the 120, 122 for the, the entropy of the whole universe if it was collapsed. Andrew, say 120 or 122? Uh, I think it's the same. I, I, I don't think the number specified so accurately as to know whether it's one of those. Is. Well, Ted Jacobson said this uh, is different. But anyway, this is the number, largest number we know. By the Bolt Boltzmann entropy formula, you invert it and you have a probability for a universe, which is this, e to the 10 to the 124. So that's the number of microstates we have in the universe today. And if I'm going to look in a, in a living system and find more microstates than I have here, it's going to be a little problem. So it means that biology is doing something that we don't, if, that we don't allow it to in physics. Um, and so this part you all know. Uh, the, 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 the number above gives uh, a measure for the likelihood of the initial conditions. Um, and um, <clears throat> oh, here's the, the, the number from, from Roger up. So um, the, the number of microstates today, um, if this is the microstates uh, specified by the entropy of gravity uh, given by the black hole formula, and this is given a uh, ten to the hundred. Uh, ten to the hundred is uh, given if uh, uh, there is ten to the twelve galaxies in the universe, and the whole of them have a massive black hole. Mark, I'm looking at you. I think it's ten to the twelve. And then Sol. Sorry, I just I gave this talk first in uh, Saifu. It's a lot of a lot of us don't. Um, I'm not Saifu. And Sol, of course, is always a Sol too. So I, I, I put Sol as a Nobel Prize winner for dark energy. 
but yeah, the universe being dominated by dark energy means that this is today the, the entropy. Um, it's also the same entropy that would be uh, was postulated by Roger Penrose if the entire the whole number of galaxies in the universe were collapsed into a single um, galaxy and there's a supermassive black hole. And uh, so what happens is that we, of course, uh, our budget for entropy is not, does not include a biosphere. It's, it's dead, it's a dead universe. And um, we can then ask this question that I was asking earlier. I mean, uh, theoretical physics, do we, can we describe the natural world with our microscopic laws? And is it in principle description or is it in practice? Now, let me see if this, and the, the, we're not, you, you guys are not all physicists, but we really do believe that, uh, that uh, physics ultimately will describe uh, chemistry and biology as well. And so when we answer, yes, we can describe the world with, um, with a very large number of equations, um, that 10 to the 25 is about the number of particles you have in a human body, more or less. So you have to integrate them. And maybe Charda over there will have an idea about integrating uh, Schrodinger's or Newtonian equations of motion of this kind, the, this number, to, to develop what is the next state of a system. And it's not, um, and for example, the next step in a many, many body system. So we're still here in condensed matter. Um, and then, so the question is then, you, you also have to ask, it's how do we, we will be able to predict what a person is going to decide because that's the, the same number of particles that exist in a person's body. Um, so it's, it gets very comfortable, uncomfortable. Uh, this is a comparison for the standard model Lagrangian, which most of you will have seen with four fundamental interactions. And, and this is the, our, uh, what we have in biology, which the, the, the only uh, predictive rule that you can give in, in biology, not a poster IRA, is getting to exist. Getting to exist is the name of the game in, in, in biology. There's not much more we've discussed for, for many years um, to the point of uh, what kind of rule that you will have. So uh, Stu has this equation, which I will now proceed to, 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 to describe. Uh, it has combinatorial innovation. And uh, we believe that this is it's just a proposal, but it's a close match for what we believe can be happen uh, in, in biology, in the language where that we understand. Uh, these were the uh, articles that we released in uh, 21st of April of last year. It was actually, let me just say, it was really difficult to release these articles because they were released at Everest Base Camp for no reason other than the uh, pressure by my peers. Um, and uh, there was no oxygen, no electricity, and it was 16,000 feet uh, altitude. And they, I had Everest Link as bandwidth provider for <laughs> Zoom. Um, and this was the view from my tent. It's actually, I lived here for, for two months. Um, and I had just done an acclimatization peak of 6,000 meters before. Uh, Sorry, can you, you had an equation with some binomial coefficients. Can you just explain what that is? Oh, I am going to just, yeah, this is um, a uh, combinatorial innovation. And this What's is the thing. Uh, it means that, I mean, I didn't, I didn't say. So mt plus one is the number of uh, different elements at time t plus one. mt is the number of elements at uh, time t. And at each step, you take possible combinations of uh, the elements, the sets that you have, and uh, you uh, combine them and, uh, and you call those new elements. 
uh, and then this is a, a simplified version of the equation that I can give already here. Let me see if we have, mm, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go it over here. So if this is a more, this equation here is more a descriptive of what we have. So mu is an extinction rate term of the of the elements that you are going that you have presently, they're not going to be successful uh, to to count for the next step in the evolution of the system. Alpha here measures how difficult it is to for the a number of elements to find each other. Uh, so if you want to to combine, I don't know, hundred elements from one step to the next step, it might not be very difficult to, to find those hundred elements. So this is what we have seen in biology. Now, it's very similar to what we see in, in cosmology here. Let me see, just see. Yeah, let's go here, Big Bang. So it looks like it's combinatorial calculus, the TAP equation. Uh, this is more mathematical, I guess. Uh, and I can explain what happens at the Big Bang when, with co the combinations. So the universe is born. We have after two minutes, uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, BBN. And for the first time, uh, the universe cools in, enough that the proton neutron um, are able to form the first atom of, uh, of uh, hydrogen uh, called deuterium. Now, this is now a novel state in the universe at age two minutes. It's a, a bound proton neutron state. However, it's not exactly novel because we have a standard model of Rungeon. And if we're given standard model at, eight, at t equals, I don't know, Planck time, times minus 43, theoretically, we can derive that two minutes later, the temperature is going to cool down and you have a a novel bound state of a proton neutron. So in physics, we call these an effective degree of freedom because we have the underlying standard model Lagrangian. We have a Lagrangian that you can potentially derive it from. I mean, sure enough, the Lagrangian is a bunch of a mess, but you, we believe that the, the, the deuterium, the bound state that happens at two, at t equals two minutes will have been derived. It's possible to predict it. Um, and then all elements if heavier than lithium are then of course created by supernovas. Um, now, what happens in biology is that um, it's, uh, sorry, this is still, still physics. What do we say for the bound state that we have causal closure, uh, we have um, complete uh, positive closure at the microscopic level. Uh, we have an ergodic system in classical mechanics. Uh, the, the evolution is Liouville, and we're all going to revisit uh, the systems in, in physics after a Poincaré time. This is theoretical physics. Um, biology, it doesn't seem to be the same state a, a problem because we cannot derive what bound states are going to form and that is the the feature of this this equation when it's which is its forgetfulness and uh, andrew at the back you you can uh, later explain um what the forgetfulness of the combinatorial equation so in this equation when you at t uh, time t plus one and you have a, a state that was formed of three previous states. Uh, that, that, that state, which is a novel state and is a bound state, will count as a new elementary particle for the next combination, the next iteration. And so it's as if when you're looking at living systems, bound states are being created from sets of different elements, but they are treated in this equation. And this is why we, we like this. And it, it's, I will explain this behavior in plots. Uh, the, the bound states that appear in the next step forget that they were uh, composites. 
And, and so with biology is like, you have a new top quark appearing all the time. And you're trying to, you write, you sit down to write a Lagrangian for the number of degrees of freedom that you can have if you specify an ontology. And the new elementary particle pops up, which is not to be predicted before. And so as physicists, it was like, what are you going to do with this thing if you can't even regulate the number of degrees of freedom that are, are, are happening uh, in the living system? It, it seems that something very, very different from what we know in physics, using our reductionism, is taking place in living systems, because if you look at it with respect from a physics perspective, you cannot identify where, what is the ontology, what are the elementary degrees of freedom governing the evolution of this thing. Um, so Paul Davis first came up with that. All the, the living systems are causally open. Um, and if you are like me, a lot of audiences don't like the reductionism uh, term, uh, but in solid state physics, the Nobel Prizes do use it as to describe what you guys know as strong emergence. And these are uh, Tony Leggett and Paul Anderson and Rob yes. Bull and Phil, Phil Anderson, Phil Anderson. And uh, what is it, Lockman? Uh, Robert? Robert? Yes. Um, and for example, when you go into the neuroscientists, uh, which unfortunately I have to deal with, um, they don't like uh, the, the word emergence. And so um, you can call that it's a non-organicist description. And you, you, they prefer to use differentiation as a, in order to escape any esoteric uh, associations with the words emergence. Yes. Um, so this is, um our attempt to to explain what a, a bio a, a, um, a living system is doing i'm going to get to the plots i've already explained this so the parameters here are the probability of the elements to combine or be be, be related causally because you you have to have that causal uh, 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 discussion mu is an extinction term so some combinations are not uh, don't have selective advantage. And this is the thing, at each step, the set of items is available to recombine with yeah. itself and forgetting that you had a bound state earlier. And so the simplest ex exercise we could do, bear in mind that we're trying to get a number of microstates to compare with the universe. And uh, uh, ontology, there's channel the molecule what they call it in, in biology channels it's um uh all living things have this six stuff is anybody like the, the you kind of of the living things as well right with climate no okay <laughs> but no so so but the, the people that describe living systems say that uh, all elements of living systems have these four elements so i mean the first exercise we could do, it's like, okay, let's have the ontology to be uh, Chernops, M, M0 equals six. You start this thing running from T equals zero, which is when they say life started 3.7 billion years ago. And you choose an extinction rate and you play a little bit with these things. And uh, this is the behavior of this thing, uh, which, so this is the tap equation. It's uh, it's uh, uh, ex more, much, much more than exponential growth. Um, let me just see. So here is the number of iterations. So NT, which was before. Here is a number of different elements, which we are going to attribute to microstates. And um, the the tap equation is is traditionally described by a behavior which they call hockey stick. Um, and it, it goes, it stays constant for a long time, and then it, it explodes. Uh, it has been, this equation has been documented to describe the, the invention, the, the number of new tools in the human uh, species. Um, we stayed with just a few tools for 10,000 years, and in 60 years, we've gone from uh, not being able to fly to having a person you know, 
in, on the moon. Uh, it also applies to the Cambrian explosion. Uh, so it's this behavior that you stay fixed for a long time and all of a sudden is a super combinatorial uh, growth. And here we have on the axis, it depends on the fire. And the answer is one more point, which is already 10 to the 206. Uh, so this is one more point, which is that. And um, when it starts to explode, this thing explodes. Now, bear in mind that this is a, a, a first exercise as a physicist. I mean, it's not a good model bio, biologically. We don't know biology enough to be, we can just then, uh, with more uh, data from biology, we can modify the equations well if we want to in, include more biology effects. Uh, but what the number we found, um, and this is just um, bound by the, the little laptop uh, was that starting at n equals zero at 3.7 billion years ago, and then we stopped it before the machine exploded. And uh, it's 10 to the 10 to the 237. And this was at the, the time of what they call template synthesis which is the first molecule of RNA when, they, when it appears. Um, so the number uh, is, it, it, it varies a lot. So the precise number, 10 to the 10 to the 237, is not to be taken seriously because this is a, a physicist's attempt. However, the vastness is, uh, is, uh, uh, is important. And so it, in cosmology, we had uh, 10, if that number of microstates and no microstates by comparison in, in life or sizable. And then we had a, a lot more in the biosphere. Uh, we just counted up to what in biology they call, they call that. And of course, it's, it's a proof of concept. I mean, the number, please don't take the number, could have more towers or could have less towers. It's not the, the, the fact of what is the precise number, but how can we compare physics and biology and particularly the universe? Now, let me see, I think it's, this is, oh yeah, this is the, the, the final few last slides. Uh, gosh, we even have a person from Pixar, it's like who, right? This is dollar from a, a Pixar movie. So th this is what I see. In, in, in theoretical physics today, uh, that we've started with a reductionist assumption and uh, we're trying, this is scratch the squirrel in ice age. Uh, there's, uh, there's a meltdown of a glacier. There's water pumping out of everywhere. This squirrel is trying to save his nut here. And then he tries to stop the, the jets of water coming out. And the, I just put here some, some examples that, you know, quantum computing is difficult to work because we cannot isolate wave function. Why? Because we believe that it behaves, evolves unitarily. Then, I mean, Charter, if he wants to explain this part here, astrophysical numerical simulations, we require precision maybe above the Planck scale in order to get uh, your, your simulations to work. Uh, we don't have Greg Eying here today, but we have Tim, um, who, who the paper is by Lorenz, and it's the, the one say 59, the 1959 cycle, 59, 59, I have the one, one digit in front. The 1969 paper of Lorenz that uh, Tim can um, elaborate later, um, has, from what I understand, and I'm just a theoretical physicist, uh, has uh, anomalies in conservation of um, energy. I, I don't want to say anymore. And then, of course, you have your black hole information paradox, which is everybody's favorite pet. And Ted, Ted Jacobson was here, and he's brilliant talking about that. And then we have a very nice one, which uh, I, I added. We, I believe it's the same kind of thinking, the reductionism thinking, uh, causing a confusion in language models and or uh, and what they do today. Um, 
because we are trying to define what does a language model do based on, on reductionism principles. And there's a lot, of, a lot of mess coming from that. And so maybe we can, at this point, uh, as physicists, and um, I'd written the talk initially for a March 2nd date. And since then, the world has changed quite a bit to include even language models, uh, to my perception, are being um, are creating a problem because we all of our knowledge is about 300 year old and we base our methodology, uh, our methods in science uh, on reductionism. Uh, and maybe it's time to, to question it. Oh, something has happened. Leon Glass enters the waiting room. And the next slide is a summary. Not entirely. Okay, that's annoying. I think it's an AI not taking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a cursor. Yeah, the cursor. Is... I know, but escape's not working. <laughs> <laughs> Then that person. Well, so oh, we, we're, we're on the next slide. Oh, maybe just don't move the cursor. Oh, is, is I still have an next slide. All right. Well, wow, cool. I didn't know that I had this. Okay. So, I, I mean, this is like a, a summary of what I was um, saying that these are all. A challenging the boundaries of reductionism. So in the computer science, I mean, Charla, I'm sorry, but I put you in the computer science slot. Is that okay? Uh, I put, this was written before I knew it. So Jaron at Microsoft, Simon Svart, um, Google research people that I'm not even allowed to, to, to say <laughs> their names. Um, but there is a reductionism problem. The fundamental structure of time, how I started working about on these was by questioning time. Astrophysics, we have a lot of, um, uh, I've worked in big, big data collaborations that um, where that show that uh, we cannot uh, treat data as if it was uh, a diagonalizable matrix, I guess, from principal component analysis. And uh, biology uh, comes the nature of living systems. And Georg Northolf is here as a very reputed neuroscientist and a philosopher and a, a psychiatrist who I really trust uh, for, for all manners uh, with uh, neuroscientists. And I hope it's already the summary. Yeah. So uh, what have I learned uh, that... Um, Number one, I think this is valid even in physics. Information, complexity, and entropy in physics are not uh, quantities that you can define outside of a context. Um, if you give me a definition for information, give me the context, because otherwise it doesn't mean anything. Um, we may learn from biology in order to do better fundamental physics and not the other way right, around. Biology is really asking, question your limits of reductionism. And um, the indication uh, is that the configuration spaces are more than we have counted in with dark energy in the cosmic horizon. And so Andrew and I spent the summer, oh, this is, oh, that's, I've got the, the, program if you wanted to say. We, Andrew and I spent the summer trying to get the, this large number reconciled with the black hole number of 10 to the 124. Uh, so are we gonna decouple this thing from gravity in order to get to explain that you have more complexity? And the uh, Navier-Stokes equation, uh, for example, uh, does not is not real. Does it isn't doesn't happen in the real world. It's not even in the limit of zero viscosity. So we're going from there, from here to there. And um, I am 
editing an art a, a volume on this kinds of questions in physics uh, on frontiers. So I will uh, ask maybe some some people in the audience. But that's that's my summary. Thanks, Marina. So we'll have a few minutes break and then you this is um this is the thing you can ask in line, in line. I wrote this for a for a for cycle for a discussion with with Janet for a journalist. But this is all the the topics that I cannot describe here. Good question to 